Good morning, um, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Ms. MEC, Jill, Robbie, John. Sorry, I do get a little emotional at these times. Um, talking about Neil is, it's very, very close to my heart, as everybody knows. I spent six years at Kingswood with him. Um, and as I say to people, we were not best friends, but we were very close. And <clears throat> for a long time, I've been wanting Neil's story to be told. And finally, through linkages with the family and connecting with Beverly, we got to a point where I was very close to, it always concerned me that Beverly being a cousin, relative, might, we might have mm -hmm. something that might be a little glossing over things. But in the end, Beverly produced this, and I used the word yesterday, the seminal biography. It's a remarkable history of Neil. It captures the humanity of Neil. Neil's ability to listen, and as people often say, he was the first white to die in detention. I said, no, he was the 51st human being to die in detention. Because that was the humanist that Neil was. And once her book came out, there was this resurgence of interest in Neil, his life, what he was about. But more importantly was my concern and that of others that here was his torturers and Jill had gone to great lengths with her family to bring it up in the TRC and, and you know, open all these wounds again. And here, the TRC report was very, very clear. There were gross human rights violations and <coughs> Major Arthur Benoni Cronwright, who was then the head of the section, and his key interrogator, Lieutenant Stephanus Petrus, Stefan Petrus Whitehead were found to be responsible for the cause of Neil's death, which as advocate George Bezos says, it's an induced suicide. And I went back to the people that were very close to the family and the struggle and the history of Neil and I said, guys, let's put a group together. We need to get some action. The final TRC report was delivered to government on 2003. Here we're sitting in January 2013, 10 years later, and it, Whitehead is out there, Cronwright's out there, and there has been no form of restorative justice. You know, as Jill said to me, they don't want money, they don't want anything. They just want them to come to court and tell the story. You know, and let the court decide how to handle it. But the state wasn't doing anything. So we wrote to Minister Khadebi last year. We heard nothing, we heard nothing, we heard nothing. And we were at a point where we were discussing the idea of doing a private criminal prosecution. And out of the blue, I got an email from Minister Khadebi who said he was going to make sure that the Hawks and the NPA and all the relevant Priority Crimes Litigation Unit, etc., etc., would get onto this case, and he would, and the letter said something to the effect, I don't know it exactly, but somewhere we will make sure that Neil's life was essentially not given up in vain, that there will be justice. Well, I... Uh, we all got so excited, and we sat back and we thought, fabulous. The weeks passed, and a couple of months passed, and suddenly we were coming up to the 27th of November last year, which was the um, 32nd anniversary of Liz Floyd and Neil being arrested and detained when they were picked up, with Neil who then went on and spent 70 days in detention, and this brutal interrogation that ended up with him taking his life after 62 hours of interrogation and you know we have the situation where you've got Whitehead and Cronwright and they came to the TLC they didn't even apply for amnesty they thought oh, they, they turned around and said they, we've done nothing wrong and yet they broke this man and Neil anybody who knew Neil Roy Jobson from Kingswood was, was with us there and 
they will tell you that here was a man, he was head of a house, he was arguably the most popular guy in our year, he was respected by everybody, he was a man's man, but he was a, and he was an intellectual, he was a thinker, he was a concerned, he was a great listener, he was highly ethical. <laughs> you know, I told a story the other night of how I, I was trying to crib over Neil's shoulder in an exam, and he covered up his work. <laughs> and I thought, damn you! <laughs> Afterwards he came to me and he said, I'm not going to do your studying. You're bluffing yourself. And I took that as a big step down. And I was a little offended with him, but we were mates again. <laughs> but that was the type of person that Neil was. He was so strong. And that was why the police knew that they could only break him by brutal torture. And this has got to get into a court of law. <coughs> so it, there's a lot of unfinished business. And this has led us as the Neil Agate support group because we picked up one of the victims who's got one of the highest profiles around. But what about these other 85,000 people that don't have the same profile as Neil? So this is one of the side issues that we're tackling as the Neil Agate support group. As the Neil Agate support group, and that's really what I wanted to talk to you about, is we follow four issues. One is to gain justice in a court of law for Neil's untimely death. Two, to support other victims of that atrocious, brutal period of oppression by the state. So that we do not have the sort of thing that happens, the Marikanas and all these other issues that, that crop up today. And the torture in St Albans and so on that's going on. Three, we need to have a permanent centre of memory for Neil and the programmes associated with his life. You've got to remember, he was 28 when he died. He achieved a remarkable... Um, a huge life in, in, in a mere 28 years. So we're all going to go through the pearly gates one of these days, and we've got to make sure that this legacy, his values live on. Not, we don't want to put Neil on a pedestal. We want to put his values and the goodness, which is what Professor Badaf is talking about. We need to put the good back in society, because that's that's what Neil would be doing. He'd be out there fighting for the goodness in our souls. And we need to get that story told, and we need to get other people's stories told that are like that. We want to help empower them through linkages to us. And then the final thing that we want to do is there are other types of programs that are being spoken about. Last year, we had the Beverly came out, but with Jill's permission, we were approached by Medicine Sans Frontier, Doctors Without Borders, and they have <coughs> a unit within Medicine Sans Frontier, which is their sort of program and activism unit, which embodies a huge amount of volunteerism. And of course, Neil was a voluntary trade unionist doing a little bit of medical work, but he did a lot of free medical work for the union. And so they, want, they approached us to see if they could rename it. And it's now called the Dr. Neil Agat Unit. It's known um, as DNA Unit, which is quite nice. Um, so we had this big opening at WITS last year, um, where Medicine Sans Frontier officially now run the DNA. So some of the stuff that's going on in um, the Great Lakes and some of these issues where MSF are involved, it's being done through their program unit with Neil's name linked to it. And we've spent a lot of time with them making sure that they also embody some of those values. And I was so thrilled, you know, when Robert first phoned me and said, you know, we got this idea, you know, can you sort of put us together with the family? We want to bounce it around. And I said to him, I said, you and I need to talk this through before I go to the family. You know, we get a lot of people approaching us and we want to make sure the friends of his, we want to make sure that it's all right. And I sat and listened to him. We had a lengthy conversation. And he was talking the type of language that, that 
So we paired them up and the way that happened. And I mean, it's a, it's a remarkable job that you've done and you've done and with the support. And MEC, I cannot believe that you are taking economic affairs and the development issue and, and driving this key crux of labor involvement and, and this wider social issue because I'm not seeing it happening around the rest of the country. And I must absolutely compliment you and the provincial government on that. And just out of interest, because I know you've got environmental affairs under you, <laughs> Neil was passionate about elephants. And as yesterday I saw in one of, the, one of your posters a picture of an elephant, and Jill will tell you, his entire life, he wore an elephant hair bracelet and he was the only guy at boarding school and nobody ever mocked him as a moffy or anything like that. And he had this elephant hair bracelet. And he loved elephants. <laughs> so a bit like elephants, please not forget me. But that's where we're at. We're about to get a petition going. We want to drive the suspension of Whitehead, who's registered with the security organization and therefore he can do business with the state and so on. we want to drive cut off his lines to doing business with the state we want, we've got unions involved far well i'm very sorry that petition